Hi, everybody. Again, it's a... Uh, yeah. For Hashem, we have uh, air, air conditioning. I hope uh, you'll be relatively comfortable. So uh, just, just to point out uh, an obvious uh, thing, uh, the Tyra last week skipped over 38 and a half years, uh, if you recall. Uh, right after the Paraduma, uh, the next thing we hear about is it's the 40th year in the desert. So uh, if you were to simply make a list of what events does the Torah say happened during the 38 and a half years since the Miraglim, well, the one thing that happened was the generation of men died out. But there is literally nothing that is recorded at all. The Torah passes over it, Keherafayim, like the blink of an eye. And we're immediately in the 40th year. And that last year is quite an eventful year. Many, many things happen. We have the sin of Moshe hitting the rock instead of speaking to the rock, or whatever the Avera is. There are many interpretations. And it was decreed that Moshe and Aaron will not enter Eretz Israel. So Miriam dies, and then Aaron dies, and then Moshe dies. That's a little later, obviously. Uh, and then we have uh, the various negotiations as the Jewish people are trying to reach Eretz Israel, and they have to go through different lands, and they ask for permission for safe passage, and that is denied to them, and therefore there was a war with Sichon, etc. So here already we read that the nation of Moab was ruled by a man whose name was Balak, Balak ben Sipor. Uh, by the way, this, <laughs> I mean, let, me, let me just start with a little really humorous remark that actually makes no sense grammatically, but it's a famous Hasidic of uh, There was a great Hasidic Rebbe called the Apturav, the Rebbe of Apt, Apt. And his sefer is known as Ohev Yisrael because uh, his main teaching was to always emphasize Abbas Yisrael. So he made the point that every single parsha in the Torah has very important Ramazim to Abbas Yisrael. So somebody asked him, where in Parshas Balak is there a remez to Abbas Yisrael? Now, Maisa, you could have answered Matovu or how, how good are your tests. But he says, well, no. He says the very name of the Parsha, Balak. Balak is Rashi Tevos. V'ahavta, that's the vase. L'reyecha, uh, love your friend. And the kuf is Kamocha. So the person says, he doesn't understand. What, what does that mean? V'ahavta is with a vav. Okay, l'reyecha is right, love it. And kamocha is a chaf, a cup. It's not a kuf. How can Balak spell a v'ahavta or a kamocha? He says, ah, when you have Abbas Yisrael, you're not so picky. You, you start going with spelling and the right letters. That's already a chisar. The Torah wanted to emphasize, when you love your fellow Jew, you're not focusing on little deviations or little chasun. It's a famous, famous uh, chasidish, chasidish of art. But okay. But be it as it may, Balak, the king of Moab, is very frightened of the Jewish people entering his land. And as a result, he hires an expert sorcerer, cursor, a professional half curse will travel, Bilam, who apparently has a track record that whoever you curse is cursed, whoever you bless is blessed, and the like. So first of all, the Mephorshim ask a very, very simple kasha. If you recall, the nation of Moab itself is related to Avram. Moab comes from Lot. Lot is Avram's nephew. And if you recall, in the aftermath of the destruction of Sodom, Lot was alone with his two daughters, and when he got drunk, they had uh, incestuous relations with him. And from the older daughter, she named her child Moab, which is Meav, from my father. And the younger daughter had uh, a child that she named Ammon, from my nation. It's marginally more modest, so to speak. And these are the nations of Ammon and Moab that were conceived in incest, and, and the like. Now granted, Chazal say that Lot's daughters had a kavanah l'shem shemayim because they literally thought the world was destroyed. They looked around at Sodom and all they saw was smoke and ashes. And they thought it was like a nuclear war, like the last survivors of the world. And therefore they felt they had to do what they did, uh, whatever the case may be. But nevertheless, Amun and Moab were created from incest. Now, because, however, they come from Lot, Hashem specifically commands Moshe, you are not allowed to wage war 
against the nation of Ammon or Moab. They're excluded from entering Klal Yisrael, that's true. In fact, that'll be because of this story. But we're not allowed to wage war against them. We have to respect their territory. It's not until Moshiach that we will take over the territory of Ammon and Moab. So the Kasha is, if there's a divine commandment not to wage war against Moab, then what is Balak afraid of? What is Balak's great pachat? There is no possible way the Jewish people are going to take any of his land. They're not allowed to. So one answer would be that... Bullock was aware of it. Right, right. So, so, so the simplest answer might be a Bullock didn't know. This was a command that was given to the Jewish people. A Bullock simply didn't know. That, that, that is indeed a possibility. Uh, on the other hand, one might have thought that uh, Moshe would be in Moshe's best interest to inform him of this law instead of simply saying, we'll be nice. He should have said, God commanded us. So there's a very interesting shot from the Shei Mishmuel, again a great Hasidic master, where he says that Balak was not afraid that the Jewish people would take his territory. Balak was afraid that the Jewish people uh, would reach Eretz Israel. What is the problem? Because there's a distinction between Hashem, and we talked about this in other parshiyos as well, there's a distinction between the way Hashem relates to Am Yisrael in the Midbar and the way we are going to be connected to Hashem once we reach Eretz Yisrael. In the Midbar, we were essentially in a spiritual cocoon. We were uh, living a supernatural existence that was unrelated to the reality that the rest of humanity faces. We get our man that falls down from heaven. We are surrounded by clouds of glory. We have this traveling well of water that in the, in the merits of Miriam, and even after Miriam died, Moshe got it again, albeit by hitting the rock instead of speaking to the rock. So as a result, the Midbar is a spiritual cocoon that is simply disembodied from the everyday struggles that human beings face. Once we come to Eretz Yisrael, life is going to be very, very different. God's presence is going to be greatly concealed. There will, st- uh, in other words, instead of having uh, uh, a traveling well, we're going to have to look for water, dig wells. Instead of mud, we're going to have to plant fields. We're going to have to build cities. We're going to have to have an army. There will be casualties. Now, of course, Hakadosh Baruch Hu's Hashkacha in Eretz Israel is much greater than Chutz Laaretz generally. But as compared to the Dor Hamidbar, Eretz Israel is filled with Hester Panim. We spoke a few weeks ago. This is precisely why. Some of Farshim say the Maraglim didn't want to enter Eretz Yisrael. They wanted to live the spiritualized life of the Midbar for a longer period of time because they thought that was a necessary training ground for them to see the Yad Hashem once they come to Eretz Yisrael. In other words, the more God knocks you over the head with his miracles, the more you will continue to believe in him even when you don't see these open and obvious uh, miracles. Now, This is why the Torah warns over and over and over again that when you come to the land and you will achieve success, do not be arrogant. Your heart will become high and mighty. You will forget God. And you will say, you will say, it is my strength and the might of my hands Asali is called a chayalata. Again, I, I don't want to editorialize too much because, because obviously we're not Nabiim, but, but some have pointed out that this was the downside of the aftermath of the Six Day War. On one hand, the Six Day War was really a miraculous type of event, a victory over overwhelming odds, and a victory with relatively few casualties and in an amazingly short amount of time. Uh, allowing us to uh, be Zoha. We just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Yom Yushalayim, the Yer Atika, the Harabayas. Tremendous simcha. On one hand, the Six Day War is actually the start of what is called the Baal Tshuva movement. There were so many people who were inspired to turn to Hashem because of the miracles that they saw in the Six Day War. But the downside was that some people had a different reaction. For some people, it just confirmed we have the greatest, which we do, we do, we have the greatest army in the world. Nobody can stop us. 
there was the attitude, indeed, of Kochi Biotsim Yodi, how great, you know, Israel is. And uh, again, it's not for us to know for sure, but some have said that the Yom Kippur War in 73 was a corrective to show us that indeed we are not as invincible, we are not as invulnerable as we like to think we are. And again, there was a great, great sobering within Israeli society. It also had a negative effect on Kos Rebbe Shuba as well on the other side of the coin. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, well, 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 because once again, I mean, you know, if you get into a mindset that you turn to God only because he keeps on doing miracles for you, so at some point, uh, you know, that's called, Pirkei Avos calls that, Ava Hatuluya B'davar, when love is dependent on a specific thing, but la davar, but la ava, the thing goes away, the love goes away. I mean, that, that's what, what's happened a little bit uh, as, as well, but I know, uh, or Sameach, Isha Torah, all of these uh, institutions are really the, the aftermath of the Six Day War. That was the great uh, arousal of Chuba within Eretz Israel and really world Jewry uh, because they really saw the hand of Hashem in such an open way. So, but vis a vis the Midbar, the Midbar HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Begoloi, open and revealed. In Eretz Israel, it'll be a Hester Panim. Now, here is the difference between a supernatural life and ordinary life. Hashem has a mission and an expectation, even for non-Jews. Yes, they don't have to become Jewish. And yes, the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah are only for Jews. But Hashem wants non-Jews to also believe in Him, worship Him, obey the seven Noahide laws. And nations like Moab were fundamentally immoral, and violent and cruel and uh, uh, did not have you know, any type of ethics. So here is Balak's th- thinking. Balak's thinking is, as long as the Jewish people are living in the desert, the fact that they're living a life of submission to God is not a rebuke to us. Because of course they can serve God. They serve God because they have uh, clouds of glory, they have mun, they have uh, traveling well. They're, they don't have the problems of real life. They don't face the politics of reality. So yeah, they can be tzaddikim, they can be righteous, they can be pure. In other words, their life is irrelevant to the lives of real people. Let them be in their cocoon and we will live life the way we need to live life because we are real people with real problems. But once the Jewish nation comes to Eretz Israel, and at least initially under Yahushua, they establish a society in which you need lawyers and doctors and accountants and chayalim and mishtara and people who plant and plow. And you still show that even within the olam hagashmi, even within chumriyot, even within physicality, even within materialism, you live a life of morality and submission to God that becomes a reproach to everything that Balak and similar nations were teaching and living. And therefore Balak said, let the Jews live their rarefied, spiritualized, ethereal existence in the desert. I don't want them to bring religion into everyday life. Because this way we keep God irrelevant. We keep morality disconnected from what is really going on in the world. And this is what the Shem Shmuel says, and that is why he didn't really ask Balak to empower him to defeat the Jewish people because waging war was not the issue. Because Balak knew that the Jewish people wouldn't be attacking him anyway. Rather, he wanted to stymie them from entering Eretz Israel. Now, it's a little reminiscent of a famous quote by Theodore Herzl. I, I'm not sure if it's in the book, the Jewish state, but it's a quote that he was asked uh, at one point about what would the role of religion be in the state that he envisioned. So the famous quote was, uh, we will keep the rabbis to the synagogue just as we will keep the soldiers in their barracks. For good or for bad, uh, neither part of that uh, predictive statement turned out to be true. Unfortunately, our chayolim, our uh, too often not limited to the barracks. They have to go out and fight. And whether you're 
for or against, uh, the rabbis have not been limited <laughs> to the synagogue leader. Again, maybe that's a bad thing, maybe it's a good thing, whatever it would be. Uh, but uh, that was what Bullock. Bullock said, let the Jews be confined to the cocoon of the midbar and not enter the real community of nations. This is uh, the Shem Mishmul's understanding of what Bullock was trying to do. So now, we come to the fascinating personality of Bilam. Bilam, very, very interesting uh, person in many, many ways. And different statements in Chazal kind of portray Bilam in different ways. And I just want to review three different perspectives of how our sages looked at Bilam based on descriptions in the Torah. On one level, Bilam is described as a prophet par excellence who quite literally was considered to be equal to Moshe Rabbeinu in some ways. Chazal have an amazing statement that the Umos Olam would, would have come to God and they would have said to God, hey, if only you would have given us a prophet as great as Moshe Rabbeinu, we too would have been righteous. So God gave them a prophet as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. And that prophet's name was Bilam. Of course, one might ask the Kasha, well, wait a second, you gave us Bilam. <laughs> Meaning, I mean, if their argument is, you have to give us a prophet as great as Moshe Rabbeinu, even if Bilam technically was as great in prophecy, he certainly was not as great in righteousness. So you might argue that Hashem really didn't address their concern at all. But here is what I would suggest. I would suggest that Moshe did not start off as a tzaddik, meaning to say Moshe and Bilam were equally gifted with the same abilities. But the issue becomes, what do you do with your abilities? Moshe took his abilities and he became what he became. And Bilam took his abilities. So it's not a complaint to God. The fact that Bilam didn't turn out, that, that's free will. You see? So in a sense, Hashem gave Am Yisrael and Hashem gave Umata Olam the same personality and one became one way one became the other way. Does Hashem know how each one turned out? Well, um, of course, you know, that, that's a, a reiteration of, of, of the, you know, the famous conflict between free will and, and God's uh, omniscient knowledge of the future. I mean, you always have that issue, but uh, at least in terms of this, God runs the world I don't want to call it the pretense of free will, but God, as it were, lets things play out uh, based on a principle of, of, of free will. So seen in this way, Bilam was a man of extraordinary insight. In fact, we see it in the Parsha itself. Uh, many of uh, when Bilam's curses are converted into blessings, so much of Bilam's blessings are references to Mashiach. There are many, many Ramazim to the final Geula. Arenu Voloata, Bilam says, I see him, but not right now. Ashurenu, I gaze at him. Volo Kaho, but he's not near. Dorach Kochav Miyakov, a star has risen from Jacob. Let me remind you that Rabbi Akiva, you know, 1500 years later, Rabbi Akiva named Shimon ben Koziva Bar Kochva, the son of a star. Because Rabbi Akiva believed Bar Kochva was Mashiach, and he was a fulfillment of Bilam's pasuk, Darach Kochav Miyakov. Again, that's a whole interesting discussion. Was Rabbi Akiva wrong? The great Rabbi Akiva made. First of all, this was not just a little mistake. This was a mistake. Uh, if, it's, if it was a mistake, this was a mistake that cost hundreds of thousands of Jewish lives. You know, the Bar Kochba revolt was much more catastrophic, at least numerically, than even the Chorban of the Beis HaMikdash uh, 60 years earlier. So Rabbi Akiva's assessment that Bar Kochba's Mashiach and therefore Rabbi Akiva lent his enormous prestige to the Bar Kochba revolt had an absolutely devastating catastrophe for Am Yisrael. But as I say, it's a complicated question because uh, many would say Rabbi Akiva was not wrong. Bar Kokhba was not a false Mashiach. Bar Kokhba was a failed Mashiach, meaning to say that in order, in every generation, there is someone 
that is Mashiach, because if you believe Mashiach can come every single day, there has to be somebody in this world that is the potential candidate. That's why with Chabad, when, when, when the uh, Babacha Rebbe was alive, there was no particular reason not to think he could have been Mashiach. I mean, listen, somebody has to do it. And he was, you know, he was as good a candidate as anybody you could think of, really. Once he's dead, that's a totally different, that's a totally different, different issue. And uh, a person could be the designated Mashiach of the door, but if the door is not worthy, it's not going to happen. So we don't really know, uh, I mean, I, I can't say firsthand, we don't know if Rabbi Kiva was mistaken or simply Bar Kokhba was the Mashiach of the door. But the generation was not worthy at the time. But I'm just bringing this as an aside to show that Bilam had these, tr- these tremendous prophecies about the future, about the Geula, about the Kates, Kates Yamin, the end of days, and the like. So that's one perspective of Bilam. Bilam was a man of immense prophecy, equal in perception and koach to Moshe Rabbeinu in some ways. In fact, uh, the way the Mepharshim describe it, Moshe Rabbeinu was able to perceive divinity through Aspaklaria Hameira, a clear lens, still a lens because you're human after all. All the Nevi'im saw Hashem through a dark, you know, perceived divinity through a dark and clouded lens. And Moshe Rabbeinu saw with clarity. And Bilam had that same characteristic of Aspaklaria Hameira. That's perspective number one. Perspective number two is Bilam was a cold-hearted mercenary who sold his services to the highest bidder. Half curse will travel. Uh, and in fact, it could very well have been he didn't he didn't hate the Jews in particular. If Moshe Rabbeinu would have come up with the uh, requisite matching funds, he would have gone to him. The proverbial hired hand. You know, I come from the. Uh, legal profession in, in which this is a recurring phenomenon. You know, the lawyer will represent anybody that hires him. Not, not every lawyer will do so, but, but many, many will. They consider it even a professional obligation. In fact, some have said that's Marumaz, even in his name. Bil Am could be read as a contraction for Boli Am, a person who has no loyalties, no nation. He really is not related to anybody and therefore he will go to whomever pays the price. Right? So that is the cool, calm, professional. Right? It's like you have these professional assassins, these you know, people, you know, they just, you know, you pay them and they'll do the job and no problem. Right? So that's a second perspective. But there's a third perspective, which is almost the opposite of the cool, collected, professional hired hand, that he was really a train wreck, not under control, that he was seized by powerful negative emotions of jealousy and lust, and they gave him no peace. It's a kind of a different persona. It's not the persona of the calm professional who never gets ruffled. It's the person, and again, similar to the Greek tragedy, the person of immense ability who is victimized internally by his own flaws. Now, where do we see this? Pirkei Amos contrasts the Talmudim of the disciples of Avram Avinu with the people who follow Bilam's derech. And it says, the Talmudim of Avram Avinu, meaning every Jew should try to be a disciple of Avram. But those who follow the path of Abraham have three characteristics. Ayin tova. They have a good eye. A good eye means you look at people with a generous spirit. You want to help them. You're happy when they have good fortune. You feel sadness when they're suffering. Right? You look at people with a good, generous spirit. That's one quality. The second quality is Nefesh Shefala, a lowly soul. Now this does not refer to humility, that will be the third thing, but a Nefesh Shefala means you're not overly involved in seeking pleasure, meaning you're relatively moderate, you're not a hedonist that lives for self-gratification and pleasure. And the third quality 
is ruach nemucha. So nefesh shefala is your relatively simple in your uh, wants. Ruach nemucha is your humble and modest. You don't have arrogance. Those are the three midot of the Talmidim of Agram The Talmidim of Bilam are exactly the opposite. They are consumed and controlled by ayin hara. Now we use the word ayin hara in terms of evil eye, but, but in the context here, this is not a mystical notion. This is a characterological flaw. Ayin hara is essentially the notion that I begrudge the good fortune of other people. I look at life as a zero-sum game. Whatever he has is being taken away from me somehow. And instead of nefesh fala, it's nefesh rechava. You want more and more and more and more. And instead of ruach nemucha, it's ruach gevoha, arrogance. Now, Chazal described these three midos in a different way elsewhere. They correspond to kina, jealousy, which is ayin hara, you begrudge the good fortune of others. Taiva, lust, which is nefesh rechava. And kavod, uh, ego gratification, which is ruach uh, duvoa. In other words, Chazal used different words to describe it, but we have the famous statements. Hakina v'hatava v'kavod, motzian es ha'adam min ha'olam. They take a person out of the world, and as the Alter of Slobodka used to say, it doesn't only mean that they don't get olam haba, but it means their life in this world is very, very miserable. A person who is consumed with jealousy never enjoys the blessings that Hashem has given him in life, because I'm always looking at somebody else and something else. And taiva means I want more and more and more and more. And kavod, kavod, you know, there'll never be enough kavod, right? person uh, always wants more and more and more honor. So, Chazal tell us that Bilam was a man that was consumed by these impulses. And again, I go back to using the analogy, like I, I mentioned about Korach, it's somewhat of a similar thought that this really is the Greek idea of tragedy, and it is tragic. You know, if, if a person is a miscarriage, a person is an unfortunate person, and difficult things happen, that is sad. That is something sad, and that's something for which we feel compassion. But it's not tragic in the Greek sense, because the person did not necessarily have qualities of greatness. But tragedy is when a person is truly extraordinary, but they are destroyed, not because of something external to themselves, but they are destroyed because of a flaw that is within. So we have these three different portraits of Billa. We have the gifted great prophet. We have the cool, calm, collected, competent professional. And then we have the man out of control who was destroyed from within by the flaws of his personality, which were kina, taiva, kavod, or as Chazal uh, described it, ayin hara, uh, nefesh, uh, nefesh rechava, and ruach gevoha. Now, what's even worse to add to the tragedy is Bilam didn't even have the solace of obliviousness. Sometimes a person might be a real rotten person. But, you know, they don't think they are. So you might say, at least they can go through life thinking they're wonderful. Bilam was aware of it. And that itself gave him no peace. And that is why, when he wanted to curse Am Yisrael, the worst curse he could think of is, may you be like me. Where, where, where do I see this? So here, the Gemara and Bracha. The Gemara and Bracha says a very interesting thing. What was Bilam's great talent, right? Bilam had the power of the curse. From whence does that power come? So the Gemara Brachos says, there is one fraction of a second every day that God's anger is released upon the world. Just for a tiny little bit of time. And if you can tap into that fraction of a second and issue a curse, 
that curse is going to work because you're kind of igniting that anger. The Gemara says you can actually tell when it happens because for that fraction of a second, the red comb of the rooster turns white, like white with fright. The rooster feels the impact of God's uh, judgment in the world. The Gemara tells us Rabbi Meir had some enemies that were bothering him and making his life miserable. So he tied a rooster to the leg of his bed and he stared at the rooster to be able to see when the uh, comb of the rooster turned white. And what happened was uh, he fell asleep or he blinked at the wrong time, but you know, just the blinking was already missing. And then he realized Hashem doesn't want him to do that. In fact, it's an interesting thing. They say about the Chavitz Chaim, that the Chavitz Chaim was obviously a tzaddik that also Hashem listened to in many, many ways. And people would come to the Chavitz Chaim and they would ask him to curse you know, different enemies of the Jewish people. And the Chavitz Chaim said, kind of acknowledged he could have done it actually, but, but he said, I do not use the power of curse. I only turn to Hashem for bracha. Even evil people, I will not directly curse. You don't go in that direction. You go in the direction of bracha. That, you know, Am Yisrael should have bracha. Am Yisrael should have atzlacha. Now, it's true. At Purim, we actually do say, Aror Haman, cursed is Haman, we say. And then we add, in Shoshan is Yaakov, Arurim kal but nevertheless, okay, I don't know exactly how you reconcile everything, but the Chavit Chaim said he did not want to be mishtamesh with the negativity of the Kalach of Kalam. Don't we curse anti-Semites by writing on the grave of Jews who were murdered because they were Jews? Well, we write Hashem Yim Kam Damo. Yes. May Hashem uh, take vengeance for their blood. Yeah, it, 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 it's true, it's true. Um, it could be, you know, I don't know, again, again it's not, not fully consistent. It Maybe it's different to say, let Hashem take care of them. Again, I think it goes, it goes back to something you wrote, that there's a difference between a prayer and a curse. It's an interesting issue, meaning, I don't want to be the one who releases curses, but I can turn to Hashem in prayer that may Hashem take care of the situation as he sees, as he sees fit. Now, Tosos asked, ah, so what was Bilam's talent? Bilam knew exactly when that little fraction of a second was, so he could do the job. He tapped into it. So Tosvos asks an obvious question. This is only a fraction of a second. What curse could Bilam have uttered that would have been completed within the fraction of a second? So Tosvos gives two answers. The first answer Tosos gives is, as long as you start the curse within the right Saman, so even if you continue it afterwards, you latched onto that force and it's going to work. By the way, um, in Hasidic literature, you find, you know, one of the uh, big objections against the Hasidic movement, which to some degree still exists today, is that they are not always careful to finish the Shema within the Zman of Kriya Shema. So one of the defenses was, although this, doesn't, this is not a defense for every situation, is, well, as long as we began the Shema before the Zman, we could finish it afterwards because they made a Kal B'chomer. If for curses, as long as you begin your curse, God lets it stand even afterwards, so Kal B'chomer for good things where God is more generous and kind. Okay, so we, we don't accept that argument. And anyway, that doesn't answer the people who say Shema, who begin Shema after the Shema. Okay. Uh, but be it as it may, that's Tosis' answer number one. But Tosis gives an answer number two, that there's a very short curse that he could have uttered under the buzzer. And that short curse is a single word, a two-syllable word, Kalem, Kalem Chaf. Kalem is, finish him off. He could have said that within the time of the Idan Rizcha, the time of anger and fury. This is what Tosa says. So there's a shot from the Chesam Sofer who says a very fascinating thing. That Kalem can actually be, you know, it doesn't mean destroy them. That's what it means. The Chalot, right? Like we say in the Hisham, the Shalom Echad Bilvad, it's not only one. Amagoleinu l'chaloteinu, right? So kalem is l'chalot. But he says it's also an abbreviation. Kalayot 
kalayot uh, is kidneys, lev, heart, and mem is moach, mind. Meaning, the kidneys are said to be the seat of passion, sexual passion in particular. Again, that's how Chazal identified it. The lev is emotion. The moach is the mind. The biggest curse, Bilam could say, is may your intellectual and moral faculties be controlled and subordinated to your animal instincts and passions. And that is what we mean by destruction. A human being is destroyed when they take their intellect, which includes their moral sense, and they use it as a way to service and advance the passions of life, the hedonism, the jealousy, the rivalry, the power, whatever the struggle you're going through. And in a sense, this is Bilam's tragedy. So the way the Chansavar understands it, the proposed curse that Bilam was going to offer is, may you suffer like I suffer. May you be like me. May you take all of your talents and all of your abilities and you will be controlled like a, a blade of grass shifting with the wind. One day you're in this mood and that mood. And may you be controlled by your emotions and your passions and your animal instincts. Now, the opposite of Kalem, just reverse the letters. Instead of Chaf, Lamed, Mem, you reverse the letters, you get Melech, a king. What is a king? Moach, the mind. Lev, the emotions. Chaf, the kidneys. Meaning, a human being is not supposed to be a machine. We're supposed to have passions, emotions, feelings. Obviously. If a person were only his mind, he would be like, what, uh, Mr. Spock on Star Trek, or if anyone uh, you, you probably remember that, but okay. Whatever, people who don't have any feelings. That's not it. But your feelings and emotions have to be governed by your mind in the sense of what is morally correct, what makes sense. Even in a simple aspect of life, sometimes you have to know how to defer gratification. That you defer some immediate... In fact, they had a study, I, I just saw this the other day, that... Um, uh, this, is, this was done like with five-year-old kids, and they, they followed them throughout the year. Uh, they put a candy on a table and said, you can take one candy now, but if you wait 10 minutes, I'll give you two candies. So some kids took one candy now, and some kids waited two t uh, 10 minutes, and they got two candies. And then they, they, they actually followed these kids like for 20 years or something, yeah. and it turned out that the kids who were willing to wait 10 minutes were much more successful in life because they absorbed, either by instinct or by education, even at that early age, the concept of deferring immediate gratification for a superior long-term interest. So listen, you couldn't tell a five-year-old, you know, uh, wait a day and I'll give you a bag of candy. That would have been maybe too much for a five-year-old. But 10 minutes was a chinuch in deferring gratification. That's what a melech is. A melech says, I'm not a creature of whatever mood or emotion seizes me at this given moment. I am a rational person who thinks about how I am supposed to live my life, how I make my decisions, what is the right thing to do. That's why it's interesting that, you know, we talk about Bechira. Bechira, right, free will. So what is free will? I can choose to do whatever I want. Right, that's free will. In a deeper way, free will is I can choose to do what I don't want to do. <laughs> Choosing to do what I want to do is what an animal can do. Choosing when I don't want to do it because it's the right thing. That is truly free will because then you're not a creature of the mood that seizes you any particular moment. And that is why you find that when God changed Bilam's curse into a blessing, you find the word melech over and over again. Hashem took the kalem that Bilam wanted to say and turned it into the word melech. 
This, by the way, uh, is really the sod of Chabad Chassidus. Right, Chabad, right? What is Chabad? Chabad stands for Chachma Bina Das. Right? Wisdom, understanding, uh, knowledge, that means really you know, emotional connection to God. Now, why did the Alter Rebbe of Shner Zalman, right? Uh, I mean, you had the Baal Shem Tov, and you had the Magid of Mezerich. So the first two generations, you didn't have separate Rebbe's, just, it was just Hasidim, right? Generic Hasidim. But then, starting from the third generation, we begin to have specializations and breakaways. And the Chabad is the third generation, and the Alter Rebbe started a unique Hasidus that is called Chabad. So without, uh, you know, I'm not here to, to say Chabad is superior, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to say that at all, but the Alter Rebbe's point was that he saw in the emergence of Hasidus a tremendous emphasis on emotionalism and passion and feeling. But the Alter Rebbe thought that even when that is developed in holiness, it is potentially dangerous. Because when you are acting out of emotion and passion, that is, number one, temporary and transient, and number two, it can change into something else. Rather, true emotion has to be a product of the intellectual and moral sense within a human being. And then you open up reservoirs of joy and tevekas, but it's connected to the chachma, bina, and das, as opposed to the animal instincts. Right? This is an issue that you know, even yeshivas struggle with. Um, and that's why, by the way, uh, Chabad is in some ways, and I, I'm, the way it became is a different story, I'm not addressing that, but in many, many ways, uh, Chabad is almost the least Hasidic of Hasidus, at least in this authentic. In other words, it's the closest to Misnagdim, in which it was the cultivation of the intellect that brought a person close to God. So, for example, we have, let's say, the Kalbach Minyanim, are very, very popular, right? People love uh, the Kalbach Minyanim, the singing and the dancing, and that's it. You know, again, it's, I, I like it too. It's an important component in Avodah Hashem. But you can also get a sense sometimes, especially with adolescents and teenagers, you know, they get into the rhythms and it almost is something that possesses them. They kind of get possessed and then it might be connected to alcohol and drinking and other things because you're simply opening up your emotions without a sense of the restraint of the mind. Now again, I mean, I'm not advocating cold uh, intellectualism. That also is very sterile in many ways. But as the Alter Rebbe taught, really the Alter Rebbe and Tanya taught that your emotions have to be in sync with the higher faculties of man. And that is the difference between a kalem, where the mind is subordinated to kolayot v'lev, and that's destruction, versus melech, where the moach is sholet. The moach is sholet. It rules, it controls uh, the moral and the spiritual sense. And the point, therefore, is that Bilam is aware of this more than anybody else. Because Bilam was a person of enormous gifts and enormous talent but he knows that he's rotten inside and he knows it. He was not even, he was too smart to be oblivious of what he was. He did not have the solace of self-deception. That's another element of tragedy. And it's the biggest curse he can think of is, may you be the same way that I am become. Right, so that's kind of the, uh, Tragedy. So when you think about it, once again, Bilam in some ways is a tragic figure because Bilam represents, once again, tremendous potential that is destroyed from a character flaw that is within. We see this a lot. We see this, of course, uh, in the world of politics uh, all the time, both in Israel, the U.S., other countries. We see it sometimes, unfortunately, even in the rabbinic world, in which very great wonderful, charismatic people are kind of convinced by their own charisma that they can break through boundaries and borders to do things that are inappropriate. And they fall and they fail. Very, very difficult. But all of this comes from the idea that, you know, you can have tremendous, tremendous gifts, 
but when you let your emotions and your passions run away with you, then, you know, you're setting yourself up for a tragic, tragic fall. And the greater you are, the harder you fall, as the, uh, as the saying goes. People who are not necessarily so great, they're not going to fall so dramatically when these things happen. And that's what I say, the insight of Greek tragedy is, is actually a very helpful mapteach to understand many aspects in the Torah, in the Torah itself. But what's interesting is, the following, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, Bilaam, <laughs> in spite of everything, in spite of everything, Bilaam came up with the plan B, meaning three times he tried to curse the Jewish people. Three times. And he tried all sorts of things, changing of location, bringing sacrifices. And three times it didn't work. Every time he wanted to curse, it came out a blessing. So you'd figure Bilam would get the message. But Bilam is a smart guy, after all, with the, with, through, through his deviousness. And Bilam, at the end of the Parsha, comes up with a plan B. He says, no, listen. Uh, the cursing thing is not going to work today. This is an off day. But I'll tell you what. I'll give you a plan to cause the Jewish people to sin with immorality and idolatry. And if they do that, God's going to punish them without my curse. And that's the end of the Parsha, where Bilam, now although it doesn't, by the way, it doesn't say Bilam, that's really Chazal supplying that. In other words, it, it does, the Torah just mentions the Jewish people began to fornicate with the daughters of Moab. That's all it says. And then God brought a plague and people were dying left and right. And then the head of the tribe of Shimon was with a, uh, with a Midianite woman. And Pinchas came. And we'll talk next week about Pinchas. But Pinchas stopped the plague by standing up for God and killing those two people. And the Magaifa stopped. 24,000 people died, but the Magnifa stopped after that point. Now, the Torah itself does not credit Bilam with being the instigator. So you have to try to remember what's in the Chumash and what's not in the Chumash. But Chazal, and Rashi brings it, clearly underscore that this was Bilam's plan B. So there's a beautiful Kabbalistic explanation that Rav Gedalia Shor brings, I, I don't think it's his own, I, I don't remember, he brings it from a source, that why did Bilaam think of this particular plan? So he says the following, I had mentioned that Bilaam's overall strategy in cursing was to tap into the fraction of a second that God has anger in the world. Now let's ask for a moment, What's the purpose of that particular institution? Meaning, why, why does God have extreme anger for a fraction of a second? What is the purpose of that? So Rabbi Dalia Shor says, the purpose is that that brings into the world the fear of God. Meaning, God doesn't want to punish with that anger because that anger is too intense. But by kind of bringing it out for a fraction of a second, that gives people yiras ha'onesh. That kind of gives people an instinct that they better not cross boundaries. Now, what happens on the day that Bilaam tried to curse the Jewish people three times, and that blessing got converted, oh, I'm sorry, cursed three times, and that curse got converted to a blessing, why didn't his normal technique work? Because Hashem canceled his anger moment that day. There was no anger moment that day. Hashem just canceled it. Ah, so look how Bilam is so flexible in responding to changed circumstances. Mm. Divine anger creates yira in the world. Today, there's no divine anger. Ergo, there's no yira today. Therefore, people are prone to do sins that they normally would not have done. And therefore his plan B is, ah, now is a good time to get them to sin. Because the natural inhibitions that might arise from that split second of anger are not present today because God called off that expression of divine anger. This is what Rabbi Dal Yeshua uh, says. Now, let me just mention that in the book of Devorim, you see that there are repercussions 
uh, to all of these behaviors. And this is why the Torah says that Moabites and Ammonites are not accepted in the congregation of God, meaning even if they convert to Judaism, at least if they're male, they cannot enter the congregation of God. And the Torah gives two reasons. Reason number one, when we ask them for food and water, they ref and, and we offer to buy it even, they refuse to give us food and water. And reason number two, because they hired Bilam to curse us, even though God turned the curse of Bilam into a bracha. But their intention was to curse us. Huh? Not letting them enter into the kahal means they can convert, but they can't marry? That's exactly what it means. Uh, they can become Jewish, but they cannot marry. So they can marry who? Who can they marry? So they can marry fellow Moabite uh, converts. Like, uh, like Mamzerim? Yes, like Imam Zayrim. Now, here is the thing I want to uh, share with you. You know, we, a few weeks ago, you know, whatever it is, uh, five weeks ago, we had the holiday of Shavuot. And we read the story of Ruth. Now, Ruth, you'll remember, was a convert from the land of Moab. So, and she married Boaz. And indeed, Ruth is the great-grandmother of David Amelech. So the obvious question is, well, wait a second, the Torah says in Kisete, Sacred Devarim, that Moabites, even if they convert, cannot enter the congregation of God. So it's Yadua that the Gemara has a drasha explaining this, that the prohibition is only for male Moabites, female Moabites, are permitted, and since Ruth was a female Moabite, when she converted, she could marry into Klal Yisrael. Now, listen to the reason here. Why are females treated differently than males? So the Gemara says, at least one of you in the Gemara, because if the reason the Moabites are condemned is they refuse to bring out food and water for us, that's only a condemnation against men, because men could be expected to bring food and water to, to men. But you can't blame the Moabite women for not bringing food and water to the Israelites. That would have been a breach of modesty and smiyot. Therefore, women are not at fault. Now, Here's a strange thing. Wait a second here. We don't blame the women because the woman says, it's not sneers for me to give food and water to a man. You can't expect me to do that. I am modest and sanua. The Torah says that the daughters of Moab came to the Jewish people and enticed them in fornication. So when it comes to offering food and water, I'm too modest to do that. Well, no, there are different ways. So here, I, I believe there's a, I believe it's from Alexander Pope. Alexander Pope uh, once said about hypocrisy that people say hypocrisy is a very bad thing, but he saw something positive in some forms of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue, meaning to say. I'm a bad guy, but at least as a hypocrite, I'm acknowledging what a standard should be. Which means the following. Obviously, the motive of the Moabite women in not giving food and water was not modesty. Modesty was the last thing in their agenda and in their minds. But since intrinsically it is an act of modesty not to do this, so God treats it as a good deed even if their intention was totally wrong. It was kind of a hypocritical gesture in the direction of modesty, and that was at least a tacit acknowledgement of what the standards of Sneeds are. You know, it reminds me a little bit, you know, when Yaakov is wrestling with the angel, and Yaakov is wrestling with the angel all night, all night, and then in the morning, Yaakov says to the angel, give me a bracha. 
So the angel says, I got to go right now. So, so uh, again, there, there are different explanations. The morning, then you have to go. But some, some say, you know, when it comes to fighting Yaakov, this angel has all the time in the world, you know. He's going to fight God. When it comes to giving a bracha, sorry, got to go, you know, got to rest. <laughs> so the same thing here. When it comes to not giving food and water, I'm Sunias, you know, I don't, I don't do any of that. I don't talk to, foreign, to strange men. When it comes to uh, fornication, that's a totally different, uh, different story. But uh, this is uh, Bilam, again, a very complex, multifaceted uh, person. And the truth of the matter is, although Baruch Hashem, uh, a Jew is not Bilam, but Baruch Hashem, but I think that uh, we can look at Bilam and we can see things within ourselves that we have to be cognizant of as well. Not to be a Kalein personality, but to endeavor to be a Melech. And as the Holy Ghost of us writes, there was a great king who conquered many, many cities, and when he returned in triumph to his native land, a wise man, it was a big parade, a wise man went out to greet him, and the wise man said, you have succeeded in conquering a small kingdom, but now you have the most difficult kingdom to conquer, and that is the kingdom within yourself. And that is what uh, Perkeyabo says, a Zeyu Gibor, who is the true valiant hero, HaKovesh et Yisrael, the person who was able to conquer the Yitzhar, that's much more difficult than any other external conquest. Um, I think Rabbi Steinfeld mentions once that uh, he once heard from a, a man who during the years where there was space uh, exploration, it's kind of dormant right now. So space is called Chalau, right? the outer space, the Chalau. So he said, people love to explore the Chalau Chitzoni. People love to explore the external outer space because we're so afraid of looking into the halal pinimi, the inner emptiness within. So we like to look at things outside of us. That's a much, much easier endeavor. So we are approaching, of course, uh, the three weeks, 17th of Thomas, uh, where we think about uh, the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and the Galut that we're in. And we understand that these three weeks, in particular, of Sadaq Reif, uh, we prepare the ground for building the temple by just like in a building site you have to clear away the garbage and the debris before you can make a building or a foundation so our job during the three weeks is to clear away the garbage and the debris within ourselves of kina tava and kava preparing our own neshamos to make it a base of mikdash for hashem and then when enough of us do that in a good enough way then indeed that third base on Mikdash will come down in Hashemite. So have a good, good week and a good, good job. Sure. Uh,